Hello everyone, and welcome back to a new video in our nonlinear analysis series. In this video, we are going to be talking about the basic equations that we need to perform our nonlinear analysis in the finite element method. Please notice that this is a video in an ongoing video series which I will be linking at the top right talking about the nonlinear analysis using the finite element method. And this is, I think, video number four. So, also, also, is that there is another video series that has been almost concluded, which talks about the basic finite element method, which I will be also, also linking above. Finally, uh, just to note that this video series is going to use the book Finite Element Procedures by Professor Klaus Jürgen Bater as its main reference. So, if you have the book, then you can even follow along. Anyway, with that being said, and without further delay, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Alright, so what do we know from the basics of the finite element method? From the basics of the finite element method, we know that the external force F is basically the stiffness matrix K multiplied by the displacement matrix D. Now this is what we know from typical basic finite element method. However, the book from KG Battle basically replaces F, the external force, by R and replaces K, well it doesn't replace it, it's actually K here, and replaces D by the displacement U. Now you can notice that there is a little t here. This means at increment t. The word increment might be strange for you. Why would I need to increment my load? Because if you know that in previous videos in the finite element series, usually you have a structure like this and you have loads applied, for example, 10 here and 10 here and the pin and the roller. And in the finite element series, just, you just apply the full load and just get the full displacement. But the, the superscript t here, seems to denote an increment, so it seems that our loads, the 10 kN for example, are going to be applied in an incremental fashion, meaning that I will apply for example one, and then another one, and then another one, all the way until I reach 10. Now, why would we need to apply the loads in incremental fashion? This is something I will be talking about in this video. If the external force equals the stiffness multiplied by the displacements, then at any interval or at any increment t, the displacement would be t, meaning if I have an external force at increment t, I would have a displacement at increment t. Fantastic. Now in kg Bata's term, um, this is basically the external force, and this is the nodal forces that are created by the displacement. This is basically a way of describing the internal forces. In Klaus Jürgen Bata's book, this f doesn't denote for external forces, which is kind of a confusion source. If you come from the basic finite element, then F was usually the external force. Here in this book, this F denotes to basically the stiffness matrix multiplied by the internal displacements U. So this is kind of the internal response. Now to be in equilibrium, the internal response must equal the external response, or in other words, external minus internal should be zero. Fantastic. Where's the problem that needs to be addressed by intervals? The problem is that the stiffness K is changing, meaning that this equation now has a lot of things that are variables and changing in it. R depends on the increment, because if you have a load of 10 kN, then, well, 1, 2, 3, all the way up till 10, it depends on the increment. U depends on the load, which depends on the increment, because if you apply a load of 1, you get a certain displacement. If you apply a load of 2, you get another displacement. U depends on R, which depends on the increment. But K was constant. I'm saying was because, because now it is not. K in the basics of finite elements was always going to be a constant. You just calculate the stiffness matrix of a bar element and you will always use it regardless of how large the load is. Now however this is not correct. The stiffness K can change. Now why would it change? It would change because for example you could basically exceed the yielding point for a material at a certain loading position. For example here, if I have a material, steel in this case it seems, its yielding strain is at 0.002. Now I'm just going to ignore all this stuff because this is not relevant to my problem. But what is relevant is that look, I have two elastic moduli. Now this is a simplification of course of the real stress strain diagram. The real stress strain diagram looks kind of like this and this is a bilinear simplification. We call it a bilinear stress strain diagram and bilinear because it's two lines. The elastic modulus changes depending on the strain. And this is kind of interesting because if the elastic modulus changes, then the stiffness changes. Allow me to explain. 
Let's reconsider very quickly. This is the basic equilibrium equation. And it was, it was this equation. External force equals stiffness multiplied by displacements. Now, the stiffness here was constant. Now, it is not. It is not because look, for example, here. If you have a simple bar, this is from mechanics of materials. If you have a simple bar element under two forces and you apply two forces, then you would get an extension delta. And delta here from the basics of mechanics of material is PL over AE. Fantastic. Now, you see where the problem is. If you want to find K, K equals AE over L. And this is the source of the problem. Because which E am I going to use? Am I going to use the elastic E or the tangential E? And here is the problem. Because K equals AE over L, this is not a constant. Because E is not a constant. Because you can see that there is the elastic E and the tangential E. This becomes a catch-22 problem. Or which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Now, allow me to go on a tangent. I want to answer the question, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? The answer is, the egg came first. The reason why the egg came first, because from evolutional biology, we know that eggs were developed way before avions were developed, meaning that crocodiles were laying eggs way before chickens were even existing. So somebody asks you, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, the answer is, the egg. But back to our point here, not I digress. We're basically talking about the catch-22 problem here. The problem is, if you want to find the strain inside a piece, you would need its displacements. That's totally fine, because strain equals displacement over L, original length. Now, how can you find the displacement? Well, you need to solve this problem, right? You need the external forces, and you need the stiffness, which is the K. Notice that the stiffness for this problem includes the elastic modulus, which depends on the strain, meaning you need the strain that you can't find in the first place. Because to find the strain, you need displacement. To find displacement, you need force and, and stiffness. And to find stiffness, you need strain. This is basically a cyclic dependency. Because if, if you want to find strain, you need to solve the stiffness problem, which is this one. And to solve the stiffness problem, you need the strain. So how do I do that? Well, this is where the incremental approach need, is needed to be done. So you see where the problem is. Now let me just rewrite this very quickly. We don't have a constant k. We now have a k that changes with the, with the load increment. Why does it change with the load increment? Because we don't know where the displacement is going to land in the strain curve. You have a displacement, you're going to calculate strain. You don't know. Are you here or are you here? Because if you are here, that's your elastic modulus. If you are there, that's your elastic modulus. So the stiffness now is depending on the displacement, which depends on the stiffness. And we do this incrementally. How does it work? Well, first of all, we need to start, and I will explain how it works in a moment. But first of all, we need to know that since we are doing incremental stages, it means that I am not going to apply the force, the external force fully. For example, if you have a cantilever beam like this, and you have a force of 20 kilonewtons, an incremental approach means I will not apply the 20 kilonewtons directly, because I don't know, maybe the 20 kilonewtons will cause a nonlinear behavior. So I don't know. And that's the reason why I apply 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I keep adding to the force. Now, how much to add to the force? That's something I will display, explain later. But the smaller or the more increments you have, the better. Since this is an incremental procedure, I need an initial condition. And in structures, that's pretty much easy. The initial condition at increment t is basically, if I have no force, I would have no displacement. There are some exceptions to that. However, initially, no forces are applied except pre-stress, if that exists, and no displacements are applied except predefined settlements. What I'm trying to say is that the initial conditions, the forces, R, and the displacements, U, are known when there are no loads. Now, from that, I can find the external forces, R, at increment number one, and hopefully be able to find the stiffness at increment 1 and the displacement at increment 1. So basically, it's a delta calculation. We are going to keep adding a delta force and calculating a delta displacement. All that while trying to find the stiffness at that increment. In other words, we want to calculate the next step because we have the force at step number 0 and we have the internal forces 
at step number zero, we now want to go to step number one by adding a delta t and to step number one by adding a delta t. Now, how can I do that? Well, this is the basic equation of the solution that I want. And if you want to find the internal forces at step number one, for example, you need the internal forces at step number zero and you need to add a delta f. That's how it works. x1 equals x0 plus delta x. This is how it always was because delta x is x1 minus x0. So how do I calculate the changes? This is the change in the internal force. Also, how do I calculate the change in the external force? The change in the external force is easy because, well, if your force is 10 and you decided I'm going to start from 0 all the way to 10 at increments of half, then you know already what the next force is. Because if you are at zero and you want to have an increment of half all the way up to 10, then you would have zero, half, one, and so on. I'm talking about the external force applied on the structure. 10, you would apply it in an incremental fashion. Half, one, 1 1.5, two, and so on. So this side of the equation, it's easily to be, to be calculated. But what about this side? This is where the entire problem is actually included because this needs the stiffness. Why does it need the stiffness? Because the next force, the next internal force, equals the previous internal force plus the change in the internal force. And if you want to find the change in the internal force, you need to find, you need to solve and calculate the stiffness at time step t using the displacement at time step t. Now, how can I find the stiffness at time step t? It's the stiffness at the previous increment. Now, do we know it? Yes. We know the stiffness of the previous increment because we know the displacement of the previous increment, which means we can know which region we are in the previous increment. Now, this is a problem and can cause errors. Why? Because imagine I'm standing here now. My U is here. This is the previous increment. And I want to go to the next increment. I'm using the stiffness of the previous increment to jump to my next increment. That's true because the stiffness doesn't change. The problem happens here near the change in the stiffness. If I am here and I use the stiffness to jump to my next point, I'm actually overestimating the stiffness because during the delta itself, the stiffness has changed. Now, there is no way to do this logically. The only way to avoid the error is to make our increments smaller. And that's what we will be doing and explaining in the finite element procedures. So to recap, this is our equation of nonlinear analysis. We need to find this, which means I need to find the stiffness, which is basically the slope of the previous step. And this is the source of error because we are using the stiffness of the previous step to kind of predict the deflection of the next step, ignoring that this, the stiffness during the step itself could change, especially if the step is moving at a point where things change, but that's an error we are willing to accept and we are going to circumnavigate it using a smaller increment. So I think it seems cool, and this is the equation we will be using in the next time. So I hope that I was able to explain to you the philosophy of how we think in nonlinear analysis and the dilemma we have to solve. So basically, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. I hope you enjoyed. And before I finish, I want to give a delta-sized shout-out to my dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos hopefully on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. In the end, I hope that you enjoyed the video and it was beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video, then please like, share, comment, subscribe and so on, especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye bye.